good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out. I pray you have had a blessed week. My name is John Thomason, and I am the lead minister here at Buckeye Christian Church. Um, I want to thank everyone that has brought bags so far this week for uh, what we're going to be doing on March 6th. If you haven't noticed, there's this huge stack. This is not trash. This is stuff that we're going to be using for our service project. Um, the reason we are collecting these bags is because March 6th at 1 p.m., we're going to be having a uh, whole church serving opportunity. So anybody that is able to come out, we'd love for you to be here. Uh, Becky Blevins is actually going to be teaching anyone that is willing to come out um, how to make sleeping mats for the homeless. And so it's a really great opportunity that if you have hands that work, we'd love for you to come out and do this. And if you don't have hands that work, we'd love for you to come out and cheer us on. That's something that would be awesome as well. It's going to be a great fellowship time for us to come together and really just be one. I know we haven't had a lot of opportunities where we can meet together, so this is going to be one of our first where the whole church is able to come out. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take these bags and they're going to be cut up into strips and we're going to weave them together. I don't know if you've ever laid on cold ground before. I've done my fair share of uh, camping and when you lay directly on that ground, that cold just gets right up into your bones. And so uh, what the point, the point of this is to make as many mats as possible for those that are in need out in Columbus and the city area there. We also have a uh, Bible study that is happening on Sunday mornings at 8 a.m. That is open for anybody. Our fearless leader, Jerry Casto, um, is running that, and uh, it's something that is for everyone. It's not just men or women. It's uh, combined. They're in 1 John right now. They're doing some really awesome things. I've heard a lot of deep discussions come out of that, so... If you wanted to get up early in the morning to go out and do that, that would be awesome to join that as well. Just show up. Uh, Jerry doesn't mind if you just show up on, on Sunday morning to do that. So, um, But we will be collecting these bags all the way up till March 6th for this. And uh, if you want to drop them off during our regular business hours of 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday, you can do that. Or if you're out here for any type of uh, thing that's happening at the church here, if you have a Bible study you go to or you just come on Sunday mornings, please go ahead and bring that. Um, but next Sunday will be after the event. So do it before then. That would be great to do that as well. Uh, last week, we started our new series, The Heroes of Faith. And throughout this series, we're going to be looking at people who have taken their faith in God and they've applied it completely to their lives. But the question is, what is faith? In Hebrews 11, we read that faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. So it's, it's to know that God is there even when we cannot see, hear, or touch Him. Faith itself is something that is very hard to have, though. People just say, just have faith, and you're like, oh, okay, well, that's simple enough. No, faith itself is something that you have to work towards, especially if you're a person who's, who's like me. I like to have a certain level of control over things. And when you have faith in something, you are literally saying, I am no longer in control. It is the opposite of being in control. Well, last week I talked about some of the wacky answers that I've gotten at youth group when I asked, what do you put your faith in? And so we've got answers from, you know, your mom and your dad and, and then like democracy and then someone said a vending machine. So it was some interesting answers that were given. But then I was thinking to myself, well, what do I personally put my faith in? So it's got to be something other than God. Because, you know, as someone that is a believer in Christ, I do put my faith in God. But what else do I put my faith in? I'm going to tell you right now, I found kind of a dark corner of my mind. <laughs> it was a place that I wasn't so sure uh, even existed, but it's there. I would start listing off things and people and, and, and be like, yeah, I put my faith in them. And then I would just go through all of the reasons why I don't actually have faith in them why I don't trust them. And through this, this downward spiral that I took myself, I realized I do not trust people. I have a problem actually trusting others. It's because I don't want to rely on these people. And, and it just really was bringing me down. And I just started thinking, well, is this really a bad thing that I don't put my faith in people? And when you really look at it as someone that is not a believer in God and you look and you say, wow, you don't trust anyone, you got some problems. You have some things that you need to work through. But instead of it being a very sad and dark place and outlook on life, I started to realize it's actually the opposite. It's because I truly only trust and have faith in one thing alone. And that one thing is that God has got this. 
I know that God is all-powerful. I know that God is the one that is in control, and I know that He is good. And actually, as I started to think more on it, I decided it was even better for me because it started taking off a load of worry because I knew that God exists, that I have a relationship with Him, that He's all-powerful, and that He wants the best for me and will take care of me. That takes off all the things that I normally would worry about and say, you know what? I don't have to worry about it. God's got it. When we put our faith in God, we are saying, I am not in control, but God's in control. And we're believing that he is what is best for us. Last week, we looked at the story of Noah and how Noah had lived out his faith daily, he had this daily faith. Noah being a man that stayed true to God in a very corrupt world. That's the whole reason that the world was being destroyed because it was a place of just terrible things and we've turned it into something it wasn't supposed to be. Well, he gave Noah a task to build an ark over the span of what would be considered a lifetime. It was a between 60 to 80 year span that he was told, build this ark. Noah would have to live every day with faith that God's there that this is the mission. I can't imagine after five years going, am I really doing what's right? Noah had to take that faith in God and say, yes, this is what he wants from me. This is what is right. Then God brought all the animals to the ark and it rained and it wiped out the earth of all living creatures. After about a year of living on this ark, the waters were finally starting to go down and they started something new with God. As we said last week though, Noah didn't really do anything crazy or spectacular here. Yes, everything that was happening around him was amazing and spectacular and crazy. But Noah just had to say daily, yes, God, I'm in. Yes, God, I will follow. Yes, God, I'm going to be faithful. Well, this week, we're going to get a little more personal into your faith. Today, we're going to be talking about Abraham. We'll be reading out of Genesis 22, 1 through 18. Here from the front at Buckeye, read out of the NIV Bible. If you do not have a Bible, we have a stack of them right there in the back. Please take one, use it, read it, love it. It's yours. We will always give away the Word of God for free here at Buckeye. So today we're going to be starting uh, talking about Abraham, but Abraham has a huge story. It does not start where we're starting from. It actually starts back in Genesis 12. If you get the chance, you know what? I'm not even going to say that. I want you to go back this week and read Genesis 12 all the way up through 22 to really hear what Abraham had gone through because it's a lot. But today we're going to just hit some key points of his life so we can really talk about where we're at in this reading. So what you need to know about Abraham is that He and his wife, Sarah, had a wild ride of a life. And we get to see some really awesome times where they are being blessed and they're following God. But then we have some times where he's messing up majorly. You get to read about some big downfalls. Like one of the things he does is he lies to a king and he tells the king that that's not my wife, uh, that's my sister. And so the king's like, oh, so she's available. And so things go really south fast, and it's a a really bad thing. But the thing is, Abraham and Sarah were told they would have descendants that numbered so many that they would be uncountable. But the thing is, Abraham was already 100 years old, and Sarah was 90. They thought this was ridiculous. How can we have descendants that are so vast that they're uncountable, but we don't even have a child. So what happens is God keeps his promise. And in their very old age, they have their son and they name him Isaac. And they found it so laughable that in this old age, they had a child that they actually named him Isaac, which means laughter. So now let's go ahead and read Genesis 22, 1 through 18. We're going to read it through its entirety, and then we're going to go ahead and talk about what's being said here. It says, Some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, 
and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up there in a thicket. He saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this, and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. So what we have here is Abraham was finally given his son. He was given the one thing that he wanted over anything else in this life. And God, being a good God, kept his promises. He gave Abraham and Sarah their son. But the thing is, now God is telling Abraham that he is to sacrifice his son. He's told to take Isaac to a certain region to make this offering. And it says that it took three days Think about how bad that must have felt on his heart, on his stomach, on his mind, on everything he was going through. Abraham knew while walking with his son to this place to make an offering that God was asking him to do the impossible. And that was to kill the thing that he wanted most, to kill the thing that he loved more than anything else in this world, to sacrifice it. For God. So he takes his son up the third day up the mountain with the wood and the knife for the sacrifice. And on the walk up, Isaac notices that there is no sacrifice. And he looks at him and he says, Father, where's the lamb? Where's the offering that we're going to make to God? And that just makes it all too real. I just think about my own son looking at me, your own child just saying, Dad, what's going on? We're missing a piece here. Where's the sacrifice that we need to make to God? And Abraham just responds with, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. And we need to pause there. Because the thing is, Abraham didn't know what was going to happen next. All he knows is that God has asked him to kill the thing he loves more than anything in this world. But in this moment, we see Abraham's faith in God. That God is so good that no matter what happens next, whatever is to come right next, it will be good. That seems unfathomable. 
Because in our eyes, in our mind, on what's going to happen, we think this can't be good. So what happens is they build this altar and he ties up his son and he lays him on it. It doesn't say that he had to fight his son or, or knock him out. No, they both knew at this moment. This is what God was asking and they were going to do it. So he raises the knife in the air to strike. And then an angel intervenes and tells him to stop. Abraham had such faith. Such faith that God is truly good and in control. I would have been a blubbering mess. I just think about putting my son on an altar. I don't think I could have even raised the knife against my own child there. And it was funny, I said this morning that I pray that God never puts me in a position to do that. And my son looking at me says, me too. (laughs) But the thing is, the angel said it best in verse 12 there. He says, I know now that you fear God, that you love God more than anything, that you have such faith in him that you would even withhold your son, that you would give up your one and only son for me. This is where this faith like Abraham gets personal for us. Abraham knew that anything God has asked to give up in this life it was going to be good, flat out. He may have thought that God will provide an offering right at this moment, and that's what happened. He didn't know, though. He went on blind faith. He probably had a couple scenarios in his head. Or, you know what? I know that God is good and that he could save Isaac in any way. Maybe the knife will break. Maybe the knife won't even hurt Isaac. Maybe he'll bring Isaac back from the dead because he promised me a son. I know that he is good, and whatever is in store, it's going to be perfect. In this instance, an angel came down and stopped him from sacrificing Isaac and provided a ram. So this is where it gets personal. The big question is, what are you not trusting God with in your life? What are you holding on to and saying, yes, God, you can be Lord over my life except for this? I'll take care of this piece. Or don't touch this. This is the way I like it. Is it your family? You feel that, you know what, they're the most important thing in your life. That family comes before anything and everything. That you would do anything for them. That you would even bend some of your values for them. Maybe even make some decisions with your life for them and not even ask God what He wants from you. We get in this trap of, well, God has given me this family that I need to take care of them and follow them. What does God want? Maybe it's money. It becomes so easy to be in this trap of where we say, well, the money that I have made is my money. That God and money just don't mix. But if we really believe in an all-powerful God, isn't all money God's money? I remember this being a really hard thing for me while raising support as a church planner. The numbers just don't add up. I don't understand, God, how are we supposed to live off of this? You want me to go to a job where I make nothing and live off support when I'm working three jobs and can't make enough money to live off of now? That's impossible. Or even worse was once we started raising money and people started donating to our cause to to build these churches, we had this feeling that we owe these people a debt for giving to our cause. And God was like, no, no, money is still my money. I've pushed these people to give. I've put it on their hearts. He says, everything is in my plan. So the question is, what are you holding on to that you just can't get rid of? The truth of the matter is God wants all of you. He wants your complete devotion. He wants nothing short of you. He wants your heart. He wants your body. He wants your soul. He wants your mind. The only way you can give all of yourself to God is through faith. 
If you're looking for something tangible, if you're looking for somebody to scream it in your face of what you're supposed to do, you're not living by faith. To be honest, a great story of faith is one that affects me personally, and that's my wife. If you didn't know, my wife was the one that was singing here this morning. If you do not know, my wife has a chronic illness that is incurable, and it went undiagnosed for eight years. And I remember the first day that it hit her. We had just gone to Dairy Queen, and we were enjoying our blizzards, and we were in our room. She just passed out. It was the strangest thing. <laughs> we had no idea what was going on. But it could have been a freak accident. Things happen. It could have been a fluke. She's had dizzy spells before and issues, but nothing like this. So we didn't think much of it. But then she kept passing out. Every time she would stand, she would pass out. And this went on over and over and over again. And we searched for answers for the last eight years. The first time that this all was happening, we were trying to figure out what was going on. We were tossed amongst doctor after doctor. And it wasn't until a year and a half of being confined to a bed completely due to an unknown illness that a doctor decided, well, let's just throw some meds at you and see what happens. <laughs> and one of the drugs, it helped tremendously, but it had so many side effects and it really didn't work to the best of its ability and it didn't give her back this life. We also had the question of, what is it? What's going on? Well, with 2020, it was the new beginnings. It was the fresh start, new doctors, new ideas. She was taking off all her meds and she was confined to a bed again, but it was promise of, we're going to move forward. We're going to find out what this is going to be. Well, then COVID hit, and it slowed everything down to almost a stop. It took almost a year, but she finally has a diagnosis. And she's on medicines that within time will start to bring her back to a semi-normal life. But the thing is, it was an eight-year long struggle and it's still not over. But that's not what blows my mind. What blows my mind most is that she's here. She's still saying, God, how can I serve you? Through these eight years, I know it was one of the biggest struggles of her was, I'm here in bed. What can I do? What is my purpose? Why am I here? She was wondering, what can I do for you, God? The truth of the matter is that her body was failing her. Her life was completely turned upside down. But she said, God, let's serve in whatever capacity that she can. She said, I'm going to follow my husband in ministries and moves. I'm going to tell you there were quite a few moves <laughs> that I drug her along with. But she was there. She said, I will help lead my children in your ways, Lord. I will teach them and show them the right way. And then she said, I'm going to help be the support system that John needs at home. Because obviously she couldn't get up and come with me. But the thing is, she wasn't satisfied with the status quo. She loves to worship. She loves to praise God and bring people together to praise God. Even though it is super taxing on her body, she says, God, I know you are good and you sustain me. And here she is. And the thing is, this is not just a dode moment on my wife. Look at my wife. Isn't this amazing? No. This is an amazing woman that's trying to put her faith in God. She's taught me so much. I have every excuse in the book of why I don't want to go do this or that or talk to this person or do this when I am fully capable of doing it. And as she lies in her bed asking, God, how can I serve you? Has it always been easy for her? No. There's always been ups and downs. But we can confidently say those moments where she was down, God was there. He was with us. The thing is, God is asking you Personally, he's saying, give it all up. Make God what counts. I'm going to tell you, he will not let you down. This week is a very hard challenge because you have to look at your own life. 
And sometimes you're not going to like what you see. I want you to truly look, though, and ask yourself, is there something I need to give up for you, Lord? Maybe there's an addiction that you're struggling with, and you just say, I just can't beat it. The only way you can do that is with God. Maybe it's something that you're putting before God. Maybe it's the things that you're consuming and watching. Not going to lie, I started looking at that myself and saying, well, how many hours a day do I spend playing video games or watching TV or reading? Okay, add those up. How many hours a day do I spend in my Bible? And not just for my sermons. I kind of got to cheat because I get to, to be in it on purpose for my job. But how much of it personally And I looked at that number and I said, that's not good. (laughs) I've got way too much time just wasting away. And I could be spending it with God. The thing that you need to say to God is, God, this is yours. Take it from me. I want you to hand it over to him and say, God, you are number one. I want you to pray to him as much as you can. I want you to pray for guidance in that next move that you're to make in your life. I want you to pray to him for that peace, to comfort, so that you know him. It's so hard to sacrifice. But God says, I will be the best thing in your life. God is good. It's time to live our faith like he's real. I'm sure God is not asking you to sacrifice your children on the altar. But the thing is, there's something in your life that you need to put on the back burner for Christ. Let's show the world the only thing that we are truly hooked on is Jesus. He's what matters most. Let's go ahead and pray. God, thank you so much for this wonderful day. Thank you for every opportunity you give us to to praise your name, to worship, to learn about you, to read in your word to teach us. I pray that you can give us the courage to follow you completely, to have that faith in you that you are good no matter what is happening in our lives. Once we realize that you are the most important thing and we make you first, it's going to shine through everything we do. Lives are going to be changed, all because we're putting you first. We love you. We thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. We'll now have a time of invitation. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, now's the time to do it. If you're wondering what that means, we have people that will love to talk to you. I would love to talk to you about what it means to making Jesus Lord of your life to making God number one. If you've already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you haven't been baptized, the water's right there. It's always ready to go. This invitation also does not stop just for Sunday morning. There are people right now that are watching online. There are people that are going to watch it later. It isn't over just because Sunday is over. Contact us. Talk to us. We'd love to talk to you about what's going on. Or maybe you just need some prayer. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is a tool that God has given us to talk to Him. We need to use it. If you have anything that you want to lift up in prayer, you can either write it in your connection cards or your next step cards or come talk to us. We'd love to pray for you. If you have anything that you'd like to do today to make a decision on, please do it during this next song. Just come to the back and we'll talk to you there. Let's go ahead and sing. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Holy, holy is He Sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to
to come. The creation I sing, praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. 